Hi, everybody. I'm Derek Shannon, uh, Director of Business Development and Lab Coordinator for Lawrenceville Plasma Physics. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about the question, will fusion fly us faster to Phobos? So that what we know fusion would be good, but will it be there when we need it? So I, I don't, don't think we have a lot of data connections down here, but uh, after the talk, you know, when you do have data, I encourage you to tweet at us at LPPX. You can also follow us so you'll know when our machine is firing and doing experiments, when there's new interesting results. Uh, and if you tell me you've done that or will do that, you might get a vacuum chamber gasket that has actually been used on our fusion machine. So fusion in space right now doesn't seem very promising because when we say fusion, we're talking about this giant thing, the tokamak. It's uh, going to be built in France over the next decade, you know, 20 stories high. There are some smaller concepts. But the approach that uh, my company is working with, at the heart of it, the electrodes where the fusion happens, those fit actually in the palm of your hand, uh, or at least in the span of your hand. Uh, and we think that with the results we're getting, if we continue this trend, we'll be able to achieve energy freedom here on Earth and the freedom to roam the solar system. And it all starts at our laboratory in New Jersey, which is very modest, attached to a storage facility, uh, where we are doing experiments that uh, are slowly getting us closer to what we hope will be a big fusion breakthrough. So, now I said the question is, will we get to uh, Mars faster with fusion? Now we all know that yes, if we had fusion right now, we would be able to get to Mars faster. Uh, but then I also want to emphasize that I'm not saying we must have fusion. So this is uh, the Mars Society of Caltech Human Exploration of Mars Endeavor. To give you some more of my background, uh, as an incoming freshman at Caltech in 1998, I co-founded our chapter there uh, with Chris Harada, and we worked on a number of projects, including uh, trying to create improved or more conservative human Mars mission designs. So this was the, some of the fruits of our labors. But you know, with chemical propulsion, you can get to Mars. We should go to Mars with humans, even if we only have human, uh, sorry, even if we only have chemical propulsion. But boy, you really end up with a lot of mass, and a lot of it ends up being fuel. So, for example, in this mission, we had a 421 metric ton interplanetary transfer vehicle, and so we needed a, uh, a big fancy rocket to launch that into space with a payload of 121 metric tons. So, that really adds up and makes it harder for us to make the decision to go to Mars. We should make that decision, yes, let's go, but fusion would make it better. But we know that already. Will it be there? That's what I'm going to address today. So more about what we'll talk about. Uh, the parallels between fusion and Mars, there's an amazing number of similarities. Uh, and the question about will we have the fusion, that's where I'll address our specific project at Lawrenceville Plasma Physics. Uh, so we know that a fusion would be good, but it has to work. And it also has to be small enough to fit on a rocket. And if it's cheap, that's good too. Although in space, we don't, uh, we don't emphasize that very much. So I'll tell you more about, uh, so who, who here has heard the word aneutronic before? Okay, a few people. So we'll, 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 I'll, by the end, I'll ask that, and we'll all raise our hands that we'll, we'll know what aneutronic <laughs> means. Um, I'll share the latest results from our lab. Again, the experiments are ongoing. And we think this, this is a near-term uh, project. Our feasibility study has been going on since 2009. Uh, and we hope to uh, move on to know whether or not we'll succeed in the coming year. So then on to Mars. How do we apply this to space? And how do we make sure that we are able to continue to a successful result, if at all possible? So fusion and Mars, always desired, always decades away. Um, so just like in space, we had the International Space Station and the Space Shuttle. Uh, those were the two big monolithic programs. You really couldn't do anything else in space. Now, now we can't do anything, now that we don't even have the Space Shuttle. <laughs> so it's problematic. So, we had these international treaties that lock us in to specific approaches. And because the commercial upside is so far away, you only have the government as a funding source. And then programmatically, you end up 
with, uh, with one or two huge programs because that's the easiest thing to keep funding year after year after year. So you have exactly what uh, Dr. Zubrin mentioned in our speech where program managers consider getting funding for next year more important than actually having success in the program. So basically, uh, there are these two big projects in Fusion are the National Ignition Facility, which is constructed and doing amazing experiments uh, right here in California, up north, um, and then ITER, which is a huge uh, paved over forest at the moment in uh, Cotterache, France, and it may eventually do some experiments in the 2020s. So dinosaurs ready for disruption. So what can we learn from these log jams in both fusion and space, and maybe these lessons from one community to another can help resolve? Well, fusion does have some advantages. Our program, again, like I said, we're attached to a storage facility. We're cheap. Um, so we cost less than a million dollars a year. So you'd think that that'd be easier than asking for 20 billion to go to Mars. You'd be surprised. Um, <clears throat> And it, there's obvious benefits to Earth. So this is the space community here, but there's a huge community of people that, you know, cares about climate change, about energy independence, and fusion is their holy grail as well. So maybe for fusion we don't need, uh, you know, visionary uh, billionaires to, to make a bet. Maybe private capital could be interested, but that's tough. So are we ready for blastoff? Unfortunately, fusion has a lot of challenges specific to it. So in fusion, uh, there's debate over the science of plasma physics. While over in space, it's more we have to persuade those people like who want to spend the money here on Earth. They don't realize that we don't throw the money into the sun. We actually do spend it here on Earth. So, you know, and there's things like the cold fusion debacle of the 80s, where if you come up with an alternative fusion concept, you're immediately tarred with that same brush. You know, right, Caltech just down the street, my chemistry professor, Nate Lewis, and another Caltech professor, uh, Steve Coonan, they slammed down the cold fusion claims, but they slammed it so hard, no one else can really <laughs> say, oh, but I have a hot fusion concept that obeys the laws of physics. You know, it's just different from the mainstream. So you have that kind of challenge. But we hope maybe if the National Ignition Facility gets its ignition soon, you know, that would be a huge maybe rest restoration of credibility. And they're both huge game changers. Going to Mars changes the outlook for you know, the future of human civilization, and fusion does the same thing. So you can tell why I like both, right? <laughs> and that brings us to our Focus Fusion program. So we actually, the only government support that this program has received came through NASA from Jet Propulsion Laboratory through their Advanced Propulsion Technology Program. It was a tiny amount of money, like 300,000, spent over seven years, uh, but it did fund collaborations with University of Illinois and Texas A&M, and those two together uh, got some impressive preliminary results, and then the program was canceled in 2001. NASA basically was told to get out of the fusion business, and this was a disaster for fusion because guess who was interested in the smaller concepts that could actually fit on a rocket? NASA. And what is DOE interested in? Something 20 stories tall that is not going to go into space anytime soon. So again, also, football fields of lasers, like at the National Ignition Facility, and huge uh, devices, they're not going to be cheap under any circumstances. But fortunately, although there was a time wandering in the wilderness, uh, we were able to start with our own facility in 2009 with about uh, 1.2 million in private capital uh, and you know, it's about a total of 2.4 spent on our little FOFU uh, there in New Jersey. And that brings us to the other reason why, other than being small, our kind of fusion should be very cheap. So down here at the bottom, we have the stagecoach of nuclear energy fission. But then even these advanced things like the tokamak and the National Ignition Facility, they're only aimed at burning a combination of hydrogen isotopes, deuterium and tritium. And those generate high energy neutrons. So you have this super sci-fi device, but guess what? It's only a heat source. You're still going to run it through the steam cycle. So that's why we want to move past the steam locomotive of nuclear energy towards a neutronic fusion, no neutrons. And so we're one of uh, just a few competitors going for that challenge. So instead of a giant steam turbine like this one at a nuclear power plant in France, where you have to convert the energy of the neutrons uh, to heat 
and uh, it just boil, boil water and run a steam cycle. We instead want direct conversion to electricity. So aneutronic, no neutrons. Instead of neutrons, the reaction only generates charged particles. So again, those can be converted directly to electricity because a moving beam of charged particles is electricity already. So that gives us a huge reduction in costs. And to share some more background, I actually got involved in this project because of my interest like in helium-3 from the moon. A lot of us have heard Jack Schmidt talk about that. The unfortunate thing is that that's also an aneutronic fuel, but you have to go to the moon and mine about 200 million tons of regolith to get one ton of the fuel you want. So boron-11, uh, you know, half the world's boron comes from boron, California, just uh, within an hour or two of where we are right now. There's plenty of it. We could power the whole world with 10% of our current annual production of boron. So just to, in summary, what do we mean when we say focus fusion? Our kind of device, a dense plasma focus, using that to do controlled nuclear fusion with this hydrogen, boron, aneutronic fuel. Now who knows what aneutronic is? Everybody, yay! Now is it hot? I get that question a lot. <laughs> yes, dense plasma fusion is hot. And uh, this is our CFO and me, the Director of Business Development, stacking lead bricks up on top of our fusion machine. Uh, but we're happy for the media coverage, even though our lives are not glamorous. Now this uh, is a patented low cost approach to actually show you what happens. We release a million amps of electricity across the electrodes of our device. It pinches together. Current traveling in parallel lines attracts each other and so we pinch together, kinking up, twisting and forming a ball that we call a plasmoid. And so it's in this tiny region that all the fusion reactions take place. The ions go in one way, the electrons go another, and in that plasmoid, it gets hot enough for fusion reactions to occur. Now, in our lab, this is what it looks like. You might not have the frame rate, but we're going to go inside the chamber and watch for the flash. Yay! OK. Uh, so that's an experiment, but we'll slow that down. That took less than a microsecond. Now, these are exposures of 0.2 nanoseconds each. So this is the actual plasma. Uh, several different shots that we combine into a movie. Now this will be a pulsed power system, so I think the frame rate might, have, might be having trouble, so we'll just, you get the point. Uh, so this is the impact of the electron beam on the anode, so there's some serious power there, and the ions have even more. What are our innovations? Uh, we optimize the angular momentum, how fast that ball of plasma is spinning. We have a method of efficiently capturing the energy in the ion beam so it can be converted back into useful electricity. We use something called the quantum magnetic field effect. We get such strong magnetic fields above, uh, above 10 gigagauss and that's enough so that a major problem that has long been perceived as insurmountable in the field, the problem of X-ray losses, cooling the plasma. These magnetic fields are so strong they prevent that from happening to an extent, allowing us, we hope, to get to net energy. And again, a lot of x-rays come off the device, but our, our technology also uh, has a method of converting those to electricity as well. So this is what uh, the device would look like for power production. Again, we're capturing the x-rays and the power of the ion beam. Um, and this would be cheap. You know, our machine costs in less than a million dollars and it's a one-off prototype. So mass manufacturing these things we think we could lower the price of energy 10 times less than coal. No legislation required to solve climate change. Everyone will adopt this based on economics if it works. Now, uh, and if it fits in a garage, it fits on a rocket. So again, a commercial system would not be any bigger than our laboratory device, but it would cycle instead of one experiment every 20 minutes, 200 times per second instead. But since an experiment only lasts a microsecond, we technically could have a million of them every second. So 200 is not overly ambitious. Will it work? Well, the initial results, again, are promising. We have record relative fusion yields that we published in uh, 2011. And then, so this is a bit more technical. So here's basically the energy. We want more energy to overcome the Coulomb barrier and allow the ions to uh, uh, fuse. And then this is the n tau product. So 
So n is the number of particles, uh, or basically density, and uh, tau would be the confinement time. How long do they all hang out together? The longer they hang out together, the uh, more time there is to make fusion energy. So as you can see, our competitors are a little away from that magical region we want to get to, while if we just boost our density a little bit, we'll shift on over into the goal conditions for the energy breakthrough. Here's us compared to NIF. This is last summer. They're making progress. We're making progress. So, you know, if it's more sort of that Olympics type competition, friendly but uh, aggressive, uh, that's fine by us. Uh, but we have more efficient fusion than they do, is the point of this slide. Now, the big news was this March when we published in Physics of Plasmas the uh, confirmation that our device, costing less than a million dollars, uh, has achieved the uh, highest energy magnetic confinement of a fusion fuel ever for any device. So what that means is that fusion is like a tripod. You need these three things, but we have two of the three. Enough heat, enough time, and now we're working on increasing the density. So this got some good media coverage. That's a YouTube clip. You can actually see it on our front page of our website, lpphysics.com, so don't worry about it being a black box at the moment. Um, so how do we go from New Jersey to your neighborhood and then on to Mars? So we want to conclude our feasibility study in 2013, uh, develop the commercial reactor that would be mass manufactured, but also develop aerospace applications in parallel, which gets us to fusion in space. So there are a lot of cool concepts out there. Uh, this one is uh, out of uh, NASA where you blast some boron with a laser to get the fusion reactions occurring. Um, but you know, there's plenty of concepts that would be great. Again, this is wood versus will it be available. So in terms of what will be available, we think that it would be better to feel a pinch. So in terms of your different fusion concepts, here's, uh, here's a, a one for a huge vehicle, 600 metric tons, but using similar dense plasma focused technology. Uh, now, again, we know that uh, Dr. Zubrin is not a big fan of huge vehicles like this. So, you know, let's make it a slight pinch. We are going to still be exploring the aerospace applications of this technology, but the fundamentals are, are pretty uh, simple. Uh, in terms of you have the proton, you have the boron, the electrodes, and, if, and that's, comes, that, that's huge uh, efficiency as a rocket engine. Uh, so if you want more thrust uh, and lower efficiency, you'd add, a, add a, an additional gas like hydrogen. So the point is, if our feasibility study works in the coming year, you know, instead of being down here in chemical land, we'll be up in fusion land. And we know that would be good, and we're going to answer the question through our experiments of whether will it be possible, and blast off like that. Uh, so specifically, these ion beams come shooting out at 10,000 kilometers per second out of the device. They are energetic. Uh, so that works out to a specific impulse, which is a measure of rocket engine efficiency of about a million seconds. That's very good. Uh, <laughs> And specifically, you know, Jupiter in six months instead of six years, it would be a game changer and Mars would even be better. So now in space, now what are the downsides? Uh, primarily, you know, you still have thermal issues. So even though you might save a huge amount of mass on not having all this chemical fuel to drag around, you still have to radiate all that heat. So like this is the uh, a Sankey diagram of the energy cycle of uh, what would be a commercial device. But the same principle applies to a space vehicle where you have your losses in this gray box and in space they're much harder to get rid of. Uh, then it, this is also a pulsed power cyclical system. So in space, what happens if you have a heart attack on one cycle? You have to have energy to restart the machine or multiple redundancies, things like that. 
but if uh, thermal uh, control issues in space is such a problem, you know, why wait to LEO, uh, low Earth orbit? So there are proposals to use this kind of dense plasma focus technology uh, for systems that would help us get to orbit in the first place. So uh, not our concept. Again, we're just focusing on demonstrating net energy. But there's so many cool things that could be done if this technology works. So we hope more and more people will start doing studies of how it can be applied to aerospace. So what would this look like in the event of our success? Uh, our major institutional investor, the Abel Foundation of Baltimore, as part of their support, our first manufacturing facility will be located in Baltimore. And uh, I guess Elon Musk isn't in the audience right now, but he'll be here uh, tomorrow. Uh, so I'm using the Tesla Model S as an example, where if we can simply match the first year production of the Tesla Model S sedan, you know, we would be putting gigawatts and gigawatts of clean power onto the grid, displacing coal, displacing all these polluting, expensive sources of energy. So instead, we have this huge positive global impact with these mass manufacturable five megawatt generators. They can go on a ship, into a neighborhood, in the basement of a skyscraper. Uh, again, there's no radioactive waste because there's no neutrons, so you don't need to worry about that. After nine hours, you shut down the machine. Uh, after nine hours, there's no uh, radiation above background. Um, and of course, because it's inexpensive, it can help power the developing world, uh, favela in Rio de Janeiro. And uh, if you want a gigawatt of power instead of five megawatts, they'll stack. So we have a number of initiatives trying to you know, make positive change in the world sooner rather than later, including a collaboration uh, with the Plasma Physics Research Center in Tehran that grew out of an appearance uh, we made on our Voice of America Persian News Network television channel. Uh, so hopefully there will be some more collaboration and news and progress there. Uh, the YouTube video here is available at fusionforpeace.org. So, we want to make more people aware of this research. Uh, we informed on May 25th the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, both about our March result in physics of plasmas and our collaboration uh, with uh, uh, the Plasma Physics Research Center. We're still waiting you know, for a big response. <laughs> so if you see any of these guys, I can name who we're waiting to hear back from on the council. Uh, we really hope that the State Department and others will realize that we don't have to be fighting over uranium enrichment. We can make uranium enrichment obsolete, lock all the uranium mines, and switch to fusion. Now, it might not be our technology that does it, but by pursuing a greater diversity of approaches will greatly increase our likelihood of getting there rather than just having one or two uh, baskets for all our eggs. So, and of course, hopefully the political lobbying will work better than when I was chasing after these guys. I won't tell you who are my least favorites here, but uh, you can guess. So, anyway, uh, the important thing is that we decide to make these fundamental changes to our space program, to make these changes to our fusion program, and especially, you know, addressing the potential for conflict by instead choosing peace. And that's why I'm happy to use these words from Einstein, that if we have courage to decide ourselves for peace, we will have peace. Now, we definitely need your support. The financial situation, despite our recent results, is not good. We have, we're waiting to hear back, like on an ARPA E grant, but we're not uh, optimistic. So tell Elon, tell Virgin and Richard Branson. Uh, we're very open to working with Ames and JPL again. Uh, but in terms of what you guys can do, uh, we have nonprofits that we work with, the Focus Fusion Society at focusfusion.org. The Fusion Energy League uh, focuses on a broader array of technologies, trying to ad advance them in the public consciousness and get more people aware. Um, and we should definitely be going to Mars. So all of you here are doing a great job, because if we actually had this positive vision for the, our future uh, that would come from a human Mars program, it doesn't matter if when we first go to Mars we use chemical propulsion, if we only have a 100 kilowatt putt-putt nuke, uh, or if we just have solar panels on the surface of Mars. Going to Mars would create a market for amazing new advanced technologies that we could then you know, swap in as they become available, whether it's our focus fusion generators or you know, somebody out there is going to decide to study plasma physics and come up with a breakthrough if we can. So thank you very much. And uh, 
think we have some questions. Taylor? Regardless of the plasma approach, the actual concept, one of the most important things to make fusion successful is training the next generation of fusion scientists. And right now we're looking at 20% cuts across the board for funding for graduate students. And that's through the Department of Energy. That's yeah. even for the big international collaboration. Actually, the problem is the domestic program here in the U.S. is now competing uh, for funding with the big international collaboration. Exactly. And, uh, we're feeling the budget squeeze. Yeah. Yeah. So absolutely, and we hope that our results will be an example of why we need to support all our existing fusion research, including the grad students at all levels, and uh, expand the diversity. So I think you were the next, right behind you? Okay, I just put him on Okay, and I have, I have a bunch. So just if you're nice, I have to keep a few in reserve. What are the products? What are the products? So, yes, yeah, so boron-11 meets a proton. Uh, it's instantaneously a carbon-12 with too much energy. It breaks oh, apart into a beryllium right. and a helium, and That's then the beryllium like breaks it. apart uh, into two heliums, so you end up with three heliums or alpha particles. So one of our rivals is named Tri-Alpha for that reason. They're actually based, they spun out of UCI, so they're right here in Southern California. Okay, I'll do it after that. I'll do it after that. I'd also like to point out, not just the key to getting the more, Sure. So uh, I, I think that's, I don't believe in anything that has fusion, but that's all we need once we get fusion. But you use, you use boron, right? So, and then just to be clear, we're going to be transitioning to boron from our current deuterium fuel, which does make neutrons, but that's actually easier for diagnostics. So we're going to be adapting our equipment for the transition to boron as part of the final stages of feasibility. Yeah, it's not, it's uh, very common, you know, there's tons and tons of it. There won't be any limitations due to boron. And so... There you go, there you go. you looked at using this as a neutron source as an intermediate, if you're doing DD anyway, like it's for medical isotope reading or some other intermediate products? Yeah, there, there are a number of groups working worldwide with the DPF, the dense plasma focus, so a lot of them are interested in the radioisotope applications. The Plasma Physics Research Center in Tehran in addition to the energy, they're looking at that as well as an alternative to fission. How close would you be to ignition if you were using deuterium and tritium? It would be, I think, we'd get 60 times more uh, yield than just DD. But again, we, we couldn't make a commercially viable reactor with that. And we don't really know how ITER is going to either. But uh, Tatiana. <laughs> Right next to you. Our yields are still under a joule, and we need at least 10,000 joules for scientific feasibility. But for example, like we want to increase the density by 1,000 times, but if we decrease each linear dimension by 10, we've done that. We've increased the density by 1,000 times with a corresponding increase in reaction rate. And so some of the other things that scale to a higher power, like if you, have, if you double the current, you get uh, increased yields to, uh, to a certain power, as much as five or even seven, depending on what regime you're in. So we are very optimistic that the yields will continue to scale. Say, say it again on the time. We, we hope, you know, this winter uh, to be transitioning to the boron from deuterium and then hopefully have enough data uh, this will need to be obviously published in a major journal for anyone to believe it. So we'll, we'll have to really, you know, check our dots and I's and T's and things like that and get it all straightened out. Okay. How are you on uh, wave energy delivery versus uh, mass of the, the uh, system? I mean, are you getting output levels that exceed that of a, a steam boiler? Like with our, from our current scientific device? With the objective next generation. We'd be better than a steam boiler. I might not be completely following your question, so check, check again with me after so I understand it. What's the watts per kilogram? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, I had one in one slide. It was like, was it 500 kilowatts per kilogram? Let's go with that, and I'll uh, check my slides in if I'm wrong. Okay, are we ready for the next speaker? Okay, again, uh, follow LPPX on Twitter. Get a gasket. <laughs>